So our third guest today is Sarah Smith. Welcome, Sarah. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Thank you. And uh, and which district are you running for and who do you represent? I am running in Washington's 9th Congressional District, and we are representative of Bellevue, Mercer Island, where Bill Gates lives, uh, South Seattle, Kent, Renton, Federal Way, and the North Port of Tacoma. Wow. Yeah, we have a huge income inequality gap. So South Seattle, because I know you guys aren't terribly familiar, South Seattle and Kent are some of our lowest income earners in the state. And then you have Mercer Island and Bellevue and an area called Newcastle that are some of the highest earning uh, cities and neighborhoods in our entire state. Uh, like I said, Bill, I think Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos both live on Mercer Island, or I think uh, maybe Jeff Bezos lives on in Medina, but still, these are like four or five million dollar home areas. And then you have places like where I live in Kent, because I don't make four point five million dollars for some reason. Um, I we bought our house for two hundred and twenty seven thousand and it was a foreclosure. So uh, you have a huge income inequality gap in this district. It's a really interesting place. So how did you get involved in politics? I've always been pretty involved to some degree, but I kind of did that thing that a lot of people did where they were politically not necessarily apathetic, but more removed. So growing up at high school, I helped organize anti-war walkouts, anti-war sit-ins. I helped with voter registration. <clears throat> Excuse me. I've done some op-ed newsletter pieces growing up in college. I was I was very active in, in politics and the Democrats in my college. And I was I was an appointed CEO for PCO for the uh, I wish I was an appointed CEO. I was an appointed PCO of uh, the 37th District Democrats, and I've done some volunteer work with the King County Democrats. Not too much, but then I also have a lot of volunteer experience because I really like to actually go to the root of the problem, and a lot of that is through organizations. When I was working for an insurance company, I actually was the only non-management advisor on their volunteer organization board. I helped organize King Five Harvest Drive up here for our company. I organized. The, our company's Seattle Walk for the Animals. I've done a lot of organizing for, for nonprofits and been very involved in nonprofits. So I actually got a call from brand new Congress and they were like, hey, so someone nominated you in your community to run for office. And I kind of thought about it. I toyed with the idea. I went back and forth and I started reading up on our incumbent and his name's Adam Smith. We have no relation. And I started reading up on him and I realized we need more than this in King County. We need better than a guy who drags his feet and waits for somebody else to make the first move before he decides how he's going to feel and who waits until the midnight hour to take action. We deserve better in a place like King County where we have Pramila Jayapal repping right next door to us in Seattle. We deserve more than that. And I don't know if you can tell, I have a lot of fire. I have a lot of passion. I have a lot of dedication to people and especially people in our district in our community. And I decided, yeah, why not throw my hat in the ring and run and bring us a better voice to Congress? Because that's what we need. Uh, how many other uh, candidates are in the race? Just me and the incumbent, actually. Uh, there's always a Republican, perennial Republican, Doug Basler, who always runs. I, he said he's going to announce, but he hasn't yet or he hasn't formally filed or anything like that. And I haven't seen anything about him campaigning at all. So I don't know if it's even going to get beyond me and Adam. So by default, I might wind up in the top two, which is pretty cool. <laughs> what was most interesting uh, when we met uh, a couple weeks ago at the uh, Town Hall for Democracy here in Portland was that uh, you had come across similar processes within the Democratic Party that we had here in that you were denied access to the voter file. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's still an ongoing issue. So quick summation of what happened. We asked for van access for vo voter, voter access network um, access. We could have data for Democrats in the area and be able to canvas and phone bank and do mailers far more effectively. And we were denied access, but they originally told us it's because um, Oh, man, what was their original excuse? I can't even remember anymore. They so many. They kind of have been making it up as they've been going along. They said there's a bylaw that prevents us from gaining access to it. And so we said, OK, can we see this bylaw? We're, we're fine with it because they said uh, we needed to be endorsed by 50 percent plus one of the legislative districts. And we're like, OK, cool. And then we also had to have state party chair approval to access the information. And so I said, all right, fine. Can I see the bylaw? And that's when they kind of freaked out. 
And we had volunteers calling and asking for it. I called and asked for it. We've had uh, other chairs and other Democratic vice chairs who were calling and asking for it. Legislative districts were asking for it and they couldn't provide it to us. And then very recently, actually, they decided to walk that back. And they said it was because I was endorsed by brand new Congress. And they also work with Republicans and Democrats, which doesn't make any sense to me because we poured through my incumbent's FEC filings, as you do. And uh he's actually made several donations to Republican candidates. So I don't understand why this is the new goalpost we're setting. And there's also to follow up, not a bylaw about that. So we've been trying to get a good reason why they won't give us the information, but nobody will give us one. And they just keep giving us the runaround and our state party chair, Tina Podlodowski is, she's trying to talk to all the chairs and she's now telling them that I'm not being truthful with what we were told. So I am happily emailing out the receipts and the email chains that I have and happily sharing all this information because I'm, I'm not making this up. This is too crazy to make up at this point. <laughs> yeah, we, uh... <laughs> We had a, at our first meeting this year, um, uh, a delegate stood up and under new business said, uh, I move that all undocumented processes be rescinded and that uh, any new processes be approved by the state central committee. Um, and then someone seconded it and somebody was on the floor and the leadership looked like deers in the headlight. It's like, where's this going? <laughs> Uh, and then we started talking about all the undocumented processes within the Democratic Party. And, and you know, we get staffers telling people who call up the party, uh, giving their opinions on on these processes that are not documented. And some of them are anti-democratic. And that ends up being a reflection upon me as a member of the Democratic Party and, this, and me as a Democrat, as a delegate to the State Central Committee. And so uh, what I don't want is policies being put out there that I have not approved or, or voted on. And I would be perfectly fine if the State Central Committee had, had voted on these things and agreed to them, but they hadn't. And so someone in some back room has decided on these things and they're moving forward. But it turns out that uh, democracy actually works. And the more we talk about this, and we more, the more we talk about the undocumented processes that are, are being floated, the more people are realizing that this is not the right way to do things. Yeah, and one of the big things that's come up is transparency. I know we've talked a lot about that. Namiki Konst had a beautiful, beautiful rant about it. And I'm sure all of us watched and loved dearly. And the fact is, if the Democratic Party wants to overcome a lot of these hurdles that they put up for themselves over the years, they have to be more transparent. They have to prove we're the party of transparency. We can't keep playing this game where we say, we're the party for free and fair elections. We want to end gerrymandering and election reform, except if it's in our own party. That's not good <laughs> It's it's not going to win new voters. It's not going to win over young people. It's not going to win over anybody in the digital age that likes things being written down. I didn't think we would have to go so far as to start a resolution to say, hey, how about it's mandatory we write things down? But now I guess we, we've kind of reached that point. And it just seems absolutely egregious to me that that's a conversation we need to have. But if the Democratic Party wants to rebuild trust and win back some of those thousand plus seats that we've lost since 2008, they need to prove that they can be trusted by people. And the way you do that is just be transparent, be honest, be forthright. It's easy to tell the truth. When you tell the truth, you don't have to keep the story straight. and You don't have to keep passing on these oral tradition laws rather than, you know, writing them down. You can be trusted. People can point to something. And the first thing this party needs to do, the first thing our party needs to do is rebuild that trust, especially with young people. Millennials are now the largest voting bloc. And they're now also the largest pool of independent voters. And if we want to pull in independent voters, we have to give them a reason to like the party. And I mean, Dorothy mentioned that uh, they bullied out a lot of new blood in some of their legislative districts. They've been doing the same up here. They've been doing the same in legislative districts all across our county. And I just think it's absolutely ridiculous. If we want the party to keep growing, we need to grow with the culture. And the culture is leaning towards transparency. So when you play these games with bylaws that aren't written down, um, oral traditions that change and goalposts that move and you can't give anybody a straight answer, that doesn't win people over. And if you want to pull people in, you got to try and win them over. And the best way to do that is to prove we're the party that can be trusted. We stand behind our values to the point that we will hold our own party accountable to them. Yep. 